Hello, I'm Joel Dunning. We're here at the STS 2024 in San Antonio. I'm delighted to be with Mark Roel, a real superstar of coronary surgery, uh, professor of cardiac surgery at the Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, he's actually profiled a fabulous one hour Medtronic sponsored uh, webinar right now on CTSnet, uh, all about uh, off pump surgery. But you were chairing a session yesterday, really, really good. Uh, it was entitled Coronary Surgery What Has Changed? And actually, a really interesting session. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that session you were presenting on it and tell us a little bit about what has changed in coronary surgery. Uh, thanks Joel, thanks very much for having me. You know it's such a timely topic because coronary surgery has changed indeed as you're saying tremendously uh, and I think in many ways you know I would say first and foremost coronary surgery is more increasingly recognized as super important and it's really when you look across the board whether you're in the US, in Europe, Canada or Asia it's about 50% of what adult cardiac surgeons do. So it's not nothing. And frankly, it is the largest tranche of adult cardiac surgery. And I think we realize, especially now with the latest trials that have compared cabbage to PCI, and in some cases, cabbage to medical therapy too, we realize very widely, and our cardiology colleagues do as well, that it is the most robust solution for advanced coronary artery disease. You know, when you look at the trials, one unifying way to look at them is that the more extreme the disease, the more cabbage performs well. So be it, you know, left main disease, for instance, with multivessel involvement, Excel trial. Would it be multivessel disease with left ventricular dysfunction, stitch trial? You know, there's no question that when you get into the extremes of coronary artery disease, cabbage becomes a class one indication. So, so I think the realization that this operation is very relevant, and frankly, there's nothing on the horizon that can compete with, you know, we're all born with three coronary arteries and its branches. And cabbage is very conceptually powerful in that, guess what, you're giving this patient who now has blockages of those native arteries, you're giving them three, four, five new coronary arteries around the heart. That's a very powerful concept. And PCI doesn't do that, right? And medical therapy doesn't do that. So you kind of press the reset button, if you will. And that is, I think, what increasingly has become really becoming very widely recognized as the importance of cabbage. Yeah, it's the concept that it treats your disease, but it protects you from future disease, Absolutely. isn't it? That's, it's Absolutely. a whole different concept, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, and, and you know, I like to say that many cardiac surgery interventions are kind of intravascular stuff, right? Valve disease, aortic disease. To some extent, heart failure can be treated intravascularly, you know, with inter intravascular VADs, and et cetera, temporary short-term support. But coronary artery surgery is essentially a bit of a pericardial operation, if you will. It's, you're not really working intravascularly. You're working inside a pericardium and you're recreating those epicardial arteries. You're adding them to a situation where they, have, they had failed, right? So, so I think conceptually, we don't have an intravascular catheter-based option that equates bringing new coronary arteries on the heart. We're far from it. And, and something I think I've seen, and maybe you're seeing as well, is the concept of a coronary revascularization specialist surgeon. We all know that there's mitral surgeons and aortic surgeons, but, but we're now seeing coronary conferences and specialists, and they then go into off-pump and minimally invasive surgery. Do you think that's really something we, we need to see in the next few years, the coronary specialist? Absolutely. That's a great point you're making. You know, coronary surgery is complicated. There's no question. When you look at for instance, doing multi-arterial non-sternotomy, off-pump bypass surgery. I'll be honest with you, to me, that is the most difficult operation I can do. I would do a tree do bental any day of the week versus doing that. The amount of precision, the amount of planning, the amount of exposure, always to a different myocardial territory, sometimes the proximal aorta, sometimes the uh, getting your conduits down. You need seven, eight different exposures. You're doing this through a, on a beating heart, through a small incision, off-pump doing microsurgery, it is extremely difficult, but it is achievable. And there's many ways to achieve that. But again, to your point, you need one or two or three coronary experts, in my opinion, per big cardiac surgery unit. And in the same token, I think the educational challenge that we have is now to bring up coronary surgery, bring it up a notch, right? And I think we've already had a great response, thanks to the STS, thanks to our societies. I mean, if you look at, current recent trials that have compared cabbage versus PCI, FAME 3, for instance, we can talk a little bit more about FAME 3, versus Syntax and Freedom. Like, I would argue 
that the technological, they're not really technological, but let's say the outcome advances in coronary surgery are far superior than what has been seen on the PCI side. Even though they would like to think that technological advances have made such a night and day difference. In fact, the night and day difference happened with cabbage in terms, for instance, the latest FAME3 results, mortality at one year, 1%. Stroke rate at one year, at one year, not at 30 days, 1% as well. This is a fraction of what, what had been seen before in Freedom and Syntax. So surgeons are doing a great job and, and they're making cabbage safer and safer. That being said, I think the next level is to make it increasingly poised to provide great long-term outcomes with multiple arteriographs. And that is catching on already. And also make it less invasive and ideally combine the two. Yeah, so, so it looks like the, the standard on-pump mammary in two veins, you know, that is, that is something that we need to make less and less common. Obviously, it's right in the certain situations, but exactly you say the total off-pump minimum invasive multi arterial revascularization is it's, it's, it's totally different. It's, it's an utterly different and very, very specialist operation, isn't it? And I guess to your point, it's a really good point that we are advancing when, when you, if you talk to the PCI people, you think they're doing all the advancements, but actually it's a really difficult and fast advancing field. And, um, and I love your off-pump talk. So basically it is the means to the end. So, you know, if if you get to do off-pump, then you get to open up that world of minimally invasiveness. So perhaps for our audience, um, so tell them, you know, what the advantages of going to a minimally invasive approach, a total arterial approach, and embracing these technology advances is in their practice and why they should do it. It's a great point. And I think to what you were alluding to, off-pump surgery is a stepping stone, if you will. Uh, there are so many technical requirements that are inherent to non sternotomy surgery. Even a simple mid-cap. If you want to do a lead on the LED, you may think that you may go from doing on-pump surgery all the time to doing a mid-cap. Well, there are off-pump techniques that can be uber required during a mid-cap. For instance, you come in, you don't see the LED. You have to dig for it on a beating heart and, and clip every single venue that you see in front of the LED and finally get to it. If you're not an off-pump surgeon, you're going to miss your mother very, very dearly during that type of operation. So, so I think, you know, a necessary stepping stone. And then if you evolve beyond, you start grafting ramus diagonals, first marginals, and then you move on to far marginals and you do PDAs by a non army approach, you have to be an off-arm surgeon. And I think the trials previously had shown mitigated results with regards to off-arm surgery, but that reflects exactly what we're talking about that coronary surgery has to be a specialized field. There's no question that conceptually and physiologically, if you can do exactly the same operation without giving cardioplegia, without cannulating, without going on pump, without having all the deleterious effects of it, it's obviously better. The problem is that it wasn't always exactly the same operation. I'll tell you, I believe, and many in the off-pump community believe that, that you actually do a better operation because there are things that are advantageous. Measuring your graphs, for instance, the length, their exact lie as you're doing sequential graphs, much easier off pump than on pump because you, ha you have the exact dimensions of what the heart's going to be every time. Tying your knots, releasing, evacuating air, uh, flushing your, your graphs before you tie them. That's more difficult to do actually when you're on pump with an arrested heart than when you have the physiologic conditions of being on off pump. So, so I think there's many advantages to it. And that community is growing. Yeah, and, and the no-touch aortic technique seems to be so that, you know, it's not often talked about, but it's such a great technique for not causing stroke. Absolutely. You don't touch the aorta, you won't cause strokes, will you? So part of that total arterial Y-graft approach is, you know, I will not touch the aorta and I won't cause a patient stroke. And a lot of patients, they, they don't mind dying. They don't want to be, have a stroke, do they? So, and that, that's a really important advancement, isn't and it? And we've seen such great improvements in terms of stroke rates. Right? I, I mean, it's, it's essentially divided by two, threefold compared to, again, if you look at the results of FAME 3 versus that of Freedom and Syntax, where stroke was a huge problem. And I think yeah. you, this is one of the many great advances, advances that we've seen in coronary surgery, which I think we have to congratulate the community and the societies for leading. Yeah, and so just going back to that grade one evidence, uh, obviously it's highly controversial. We have we have a grade one recommendation of triple vessels with impaired LV function. But but what are we going to do about uh, about this this misgrading of of the recommendations about revascularization? Is it something we can do as surgeons, or you know, should we? What what is your your view on this whole situation? Yeah, that that is a difficult conundrum because I I think 
You know, a lot of it rests on the recent evidence provided by the ischemia trial. In the ischemia trial, many prominent cardiologists, even investigators of the ischemia trial themselves will tell you, was not meant to compare revascularization versus non-revascularization. The randomization happened upstream of that. It was really whether someone with moderate to severe ischemia on imaging would go straight to an angiogram or wait and have an initial conservative therapy. So unfortunately, it got misinterpreted as an allocation of randomized allocation of revascularization or not. There was no randomization. Once the angiogram was done and say three vessel disease was identified, in many cases it wasn't, or it wasn't involving the proximal LED and patients got appropriately PCI or medical therapy. But once that angiogram was performed, everything was allocated according to current practice of care or standard of care, if you will. So we cannot now go and say, well, we have this angiogram before us that shows three vessel disease based on ischemia trial. Maybe we shouldn't revascularize. Right? That is the mistake. And I think that even the guideline in some way fell into that trap. Um, so we have to be very, very cognizant. There's actually more modern data than the usual quoted the original use of 1994 Lancet meta-analysis that had to look at the European trial, the VA trial, et cetera, that had kind of laid the foundations of the indications for cabbage. There's more recent data that we have. We published this in the journal, first author Godino and, and, and a bunch of us about a year and a half ago. And you can see there's more data comparing medical therapy versus cabbage. That data is available and certainly goes exactly along the same lines as the original data. Well, people say we have better statins, we have better medical therapy, but that does not exclude cabbage patients, right? They can benefit from that too. And we know it has a huge impact into this. So I think it's, it's unfortunate um, that we now have this conundrum, uh, but I would also argue that in reality, the guidelines have probably not changed practice that much. Uh, we see uh, many centers note an increase in cabbage numbers. I don't know if that's the case at, at your center, but uh, this is something across the board that is, uh, I think, meant to show that cabbage is a very, very valid operation for the future. Yeah, so, and, and just to finish off, you know, where do you think we're going with revascularization in yeah. the next five years? You know, do you think we will see specialization, minimally invasive? Is that the future? I, I do think we need to specialize. There's no question. We need to, cabbage can be done very safely, but it can be done in a better way. There's already a lot of multiple arterial grafting, but there's no question that there's probably too many vein grafts being utilized. Right? You were talking about the LITA plus two example. That may be great for a majority of patients, but for young patients or patients who may benefit, say, from a less invasive approach, we need to have something else in our toolbox, right? And, and that's why, you know, I'm gonna, pit a, I'm gonna put a bit of a plug for the STS coronary conference here, but we, we need to also dedicate some of our education to advanced coronary surgery. I'm not saying everyone has to do like a total arterial grafting, non-sternotomy off pump on everybody. It's not for every patient, it's not for every surgeon, but I think major units should be able to specialize into it, have maybe one or two go-to person. And it's really a team effort, right? Anesthesiology, uh, APPs, cardiologists have to be involved. And cardiologists are actually, they're part of the solution. There are really many, many ways to improve the results of cabbage, right? You can do uh, hybrid approaches. You can do hybrid with a simple liter to the LED, maybe not sternotomy, hopefully. But you can also do liter rita robotic takedown put the lead test, say, on the circumflex, the return on the LED, and then stand the right, which is kind of my go-to operation now. Uh, and it's a beautiful procedure where patients go home literally post-op day two. They have a stand the next day, they have the two mammaries injected, and that works extremely well. Y you could argue that with two patent mammaries on the left heart circulation, what's going to happen to this patient from a coronary artery disease point of view? Not a lot, right? And then you add the benefit of a stent in the right, which usually has fairly good outcome, especially in the right coronary artery. So I think coronary surgery has a lot of promise and, and we are really getting into this um, period of time where things are starting to gel, right? We see many, many more centers doing single or multivessel non-sternotomy surgery. We see 
much more uptake of multi-arterial grafting. We see much better outcomes. It's much safer, as we were alluding to, comparing FAME 3, for instance, to, uh, to Syntax and Freedom. So I think we're already on a roll there. And I would say of all the areas of adult cardiac surgery, heart failure, aortic, valvular, and coronary, coronary is probably the one which is ready uh, on an upslope right now in terms of developing new surgical techniques, you know, as opposed to relegating more to transcatheter alternatives. So, so I think it's very important. And again, I would encourage everyone to come to the STS Coronary Conference this year, June 8, June 7 and 8, 2024 in Miami Beach. For Wonderful. Well, that's an absolutely fantastic uh, point to finish on. And thank you very much for your vision and leadership in this area. It's really, really important for our whole community. So thank you so much. Thank you. The pleasure was mine, Joel.